Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the fifth episode of Thrive With Your Family. This is a weekly web series that's hosted by Michigan Medicine from CS Mott Children's Hospital and the Department of Psychiatry. Um, we are answering your questions on this weekly series to try and help families cope with the stress and the school closures and all the other changes happening with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have been so appreciative of all the questions that you've been sending in through our website. And our, um, I'm excited today to introduce our new panel that is here to talk about how to help kids who have chronic illness, who have other medical conditions that make life a little bit more complicated right now. Um, before we get started though, I wanted to recap a little bit of what we've talked about so far. So this is episode number five. We've done four others. The first one, we really tried to focus in on how are kids reacting emotionally and behaviorally to all the changes. We also talked about parents, how to center yourself and think about what your child might be going through emotionally, what their behavior means, and how to give yourself a break, um, not try to juggle all those glass balls, let some of them drop and be rubber balls, and to be able to handle all the different demands that are being asked of us right now as parents. Episode two, we went a little bit more in a deep dive about self-care, how to actually check in with your senses and what's going on around you to be able to regulate your, your body and your emotions. Um, and how to help kids through their anxiety as well. Episode three, we brought in some experts on teens and how to help them maintain their relationships, whether it's online or offline, and how to help them manage the loss and the grief that they're having right now of not being able to be in their school and their sports and seeing their friends. Um, and last week, episode four, we talked about kids with um, developmental differences who may be missing a lot of their school therapies, their outpatient therapies, and how to help build some skills at home. So today we're going to be talking about kids who've had medical issues before and whose families now are helping to manage those medical issues at home, are um, you know, having a harder time with readjusting to uh, all being at home or things opening back up again. Um, I, we have a, a great group of psychologists and psychiatrists with us today. Um, the first is Dr. Nasu Malis, um, who's from the Department of Child Psychiatry. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your work, just so that the audience kind of knows what your background is? Thank you, Jenny. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to learn from each other, learn together during this very challenging time. and. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this event. Uh, so my name is Nasu Malis. I've uh, been at the University of Michigan for six years. I am the director of our consultation liaison psychiatry service. So what does that mean? Um, so I provide consultation at our children's hospital for youth with a variety of different physical illnesses, either uh, short-term or long-term, and uh, provide consultation for their psychiatric needs. and that can involve emotional, uh, behavioral, or um, other cognitive effects. And one of the um, unique aspects of what I do is I can not only provide diagnostic assessment uh, and some uh, therapeutic uh, language and discussion, but I can also offer medications as another tool to support youth. Uh, and in that way, support uh, families in supporting their young ones. Uh, their adolescents in uh, promoting their health. Awesome. So thank you for joining us. And I think it's great to hear your insight of what you've experienced, um, you know, on the inpatient services where families are struggling with both intense medical needs as well as intense psychological needs, adjusting to illness or to, you know, all the life changes around us right now. And then we have Dr. Dana Albright from Child Psychology. Um, so Dr. Albright, tell us a little bit about the work you do with families. Sure, so I am, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and I primarily work with kids with chronic illnesses, specifically within our uh, pediatric diabetes program. And so a lot of my work is helping families first of all, adjust to life with chronic illness, how to do all of the things that we love to do outside of maintaining our health while still um, caring for the specifics 
a specific task required with diabetes. And so that's a big part of what I do, but then also talking about um, how to complete the daily cares of required with a chronic illness, um, like taking insulin, testing blood sugars, monitoring um, activity and things like that. And so um, my research really focuses on how do we improve identifying mental health concerns and also identifying those that are struggling with life with diabetes. Great. So I hope we get to some of the nuts and bolts of how families can work through their day-to-day health tasks today, because I know sometimes it's it's great when we all just get dressed in the morning in my household. So um, I think families will appreciate all some tips on how to maintain some order and get motivated when it's hard to get them motivated to do much more than uh, watch TV sometimes. Um, so, so again, parents, thank you for sending in your questions. I first, before we go into the few that we're going to cover today. I wanted to take note of the fact that some of the questions we got, they were excellent, but they were too specific medically for us to answer today. And that's because they had to do with things like, if my child has an immune suppression and needs to go back to school, but there's no vaccine, what should I do? You know, if my child has a chronic condition, um, such as cystic fibrosis, it makes it harder, that they may be more susceptible to a respiratory virus. How should I handle some of the opening up of society or of schools that may happen in the coming months. So while we can't be your medical providers to give you that specific guidance, we really encourage you to reach out to the clinics that your children are seen in because the doc- their doctors, nurse practitioners, and other healthcare providers are going to know, they know your child and they know the specific guidance that, that they'll want to be giving their patients. But the underlying theme in a lot of those questions is you know, are things going to be reopening in the next couple of months? How should we deal with some of these openings and closures that may happen over the next few months as the virus gets more under control and then starts to pop up again? And what we're hearing from healthcare providers is that there's a lot, and and um, public health specialists at the state and country level is that we don't always know. We may um, have a lot of uncertainty over when kids can go back to summer camp or how big their classroom sizes are gonna be. And that's leading to a lot of anxiety for families who who are barely just adjusting to the fact that we've all been stuck at home for two months and and maybe we've set up a little sense of new normal at home, but it's hard to think about then opening life back up again and and bringing in more risk. So I think I just wanna acknowledge that those were great questions and that we all are dealing with this sense of uncertainty of like, what should, our next steps be. Um, One of our questions though, for Dr. Mollis, um, that I felt really tapped into that sense of uncertainty was that there's so much uncertainty in the world today. And my child with chronic illness does not do well with such unexpected changes. Um, How do I create a sense of safety and structure in such an uncertain world? So, sorry, I muted myself. Tell us a little bit about you know, when families are facing, and I'm sure you hear this all the time when they may get a new diagnosis and are waiting for treatment to occur, or um, when there's been, you know, a sudden change to someone's health status, and you have to deal with this sense of not knowing what's coming the next hour, the next day, you know, or the next several months. Uh, Thank you, Jenny. I, I think that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, first of all, I just want to recognize how unprecedented uh, this pandemic has been and uh, how unbelievable the level of distress and trauma and difficulty that people have had to experience. Um, And and so we know that uh, individuals with chronic illness and the families that support and love them often deal with uncertainty pre-pandemic. And so uh, this just amplifies that level of uncertainty to uh, tremendous heights. Uh, In my role uh, in the hospital, uh, I work both on our uh, inpatient psychiatric uh, unit, the the psychiatric hospital, as well as consultation in the medical hospital. And the amount of shifting and evolving and flexibility and um, you know, sometimes even inconsistencies where one day uh, we have one kind of dogma and practice and then the next day it changes. Uh, It's exhausting. And I I think at first and foremost, 
we need to recognize that that uncertainty exists and be kind to ourselves and be kind to our our kids and and really model that for our kids um, so that they can see that you know this is this is hard and this is not something that we should expect anybody should be able to do just naturally uh, and intuitively for for us as physicians as uh, psychologists it's extremely challenging once we start with that awareness uh, i think knowledge is really power uh, in this situation so uh, i would hearken to what you said jenny earlier which is um, really trying to understand from the professionals that your child works with um, what are the current standards? Really trying to understand that because once you can ground yourself with that information, that can allay some of the distress and anxiety by knowing what to anticipate uh, when you can, um, knowing what the parameters are for certain cares, knowing the resources that exist, that can be helpful. The, the other thing, um, once you've kind of established that, is really uh, helping yourself know what you have control over and what is out of your control. The, the most frustrating thing that can happen, and we see this all the time, and I've been victim of this myself, is to try to assert control over something that you don't really have control over. So anticipating, you know, you know, is the virus going to return in certain areas? Uh, anticipating what the school is going to do months ahead of time when the school doesn't even know what they're going to do creates a lot of angst, both for the child, for the adolescent, for the family, without any kind of productive outlets to be able to allay that anxiety. So it's helpful to kind of go through a practice, a self-reflection of thinking about what we can control. And then once you've kind of established that, those spheres of control, then you can go through what you as families know really work for you as families, those routines, those schedules, those practices that instill joy, instill a sense of stability, uh, and, and each child and each family is unique in that regard. But um, you know, some families like to have a schedule posted somewhere. Some like uh, schedules in their phones. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of different practices, but reflecting on what has worked during that uncertainty, because that uncertainty has been there, uh, it's just been amplified and then really trying to use that knowledge and use the strengths that the family has and the child has to really embed those and practice those especially now that i think we have a little bit of time before i think things are going to start um, ramping up a little bit more where we can start to really practice some of those um, skills and strategies at home um, so that for the things we can control we can create uh, some stability and that will reduce the uncertainty. But unfortunately, uncertainty is probably going to be with us for a while and can't be completely eliminated. And so that, I guess this is a question for all of you is that, are there any kind of concrete practical tasks that you think um, children really get a nice sense of control out of, whether it's through, you know, sometimes I'll recommend play, where they, if they're a younger child, they get to pretend that they're the doctor or they're the veterinarian or they're someone, the teacher who gets to be in control. Um, or, or some sort of helper role where they feel like they've controlled something and contributed and they can see what sort of progress they've made. Like my 10-year-old, uh, this weekend, the, the best thing for his uh, kind of calmness was he transferred mulch from the front to the back of the house. And he just was the mulch carrier in the wheelbarrow. And, you know, we're lucky enough to have a yard where he could do that, but there was something probably sensory and also just, you know, satisfying about being able to help out. So are there any, you know, for, for a family who might be listening to this and saying, yeah, all my usual tricks don't work right now. You know, what are the sort of things that they might try out with their kids to give them a sense of daily control? Yeah, Jenny, um, you know, I, I work with pediatric organ transplant population. And, um, you know, as, as Nasu was mentioning, our, our patients and families with chronic illness often live um, with one foot in the world of uncertainty. And, and solid organ transplant is, is full of uncertainties. We, we never know, we can never predict 
um, when an organ transplant may occur, et cetera. And so one thing I, I've, I've always talked about with my patients um, that I think really applies to the uncertainties that we're facing now is, you know, I tell them, let's ask ourselves two questions. You know, first, is this thought or this worry that I'm having true? Um, is it true? You know, and, and, and I think that a lot of the things that, that are feeling uncertain and are feeling worrisome in our lives are true right now. Um, and that's the case a lot of times with the patients that I'm, that I'm working with. Is it true that, you know, they still may be in the hospital when uh, graduation comes, et cetera? Like those, those are true worries. Sometimes we find that, you know, those worries or those uncertainties we've, we've taken to a, to a bigger level and we've, we've blown them out of proportion a little bit and we're able to, to rein it in. Um, so, so say we've identified, okay, well, these uncertainties, like will my kid be able to go back to school in the fall and will there still be summer camp? Those are, those are true worries. So then the next question we talk about, well, is this helpful? Is this, is this time I'm spending on this helping me? Um, and if not, how do I change that channel? How do I get off this worry? And so the, the control being that they can identify what it is that's causing them this angst and they can identify whether or not this is helping them in their day to day. And if not, then let's refocus on something else. And so that's usually when we bring positive distraction into the, into the day um, and saying, okay, we've identified the worry. We've identified where we're going with this. And now let's let's change the channel. Let's do something else. Let's let's play a game or let's go outside. Let's call a friend. Um, and so so that's one tip that um, I've used for years with patients that I think really applies um, right now in this time where there are really real worries and real things um, to feel discomfort about, um, and just identifying that those aren't helpful for us and that we we want to put something else in its place as much as we can, and and redoing that over and over as much as we need to. Those are great points. I would also add that I think as much as we can provide children and even adolescents choice in what they're doing, you kind of alluded to how do we gain control? What are the aspects we have control over? Um, I think one strategy that I really like is thinking about options that a parent is okay with. That might be a location where something happens. That may be the time frame in which something happens. Um, my family probably gets so annoyed hearing me say, do you want to do it right now or in five minutes? Um, even the adults in my life sometimes hear me give that choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so two choices in which you're okay with and thinking about how do we let people make those choices because so many things are now out of their control and so showing kids and showing family members that um, there are aspects in their control and the other piece I think that can be really helpful is taking the time to identify those times like you were mentioning Denny when your son was being so helpful and carrying that mulch <laughs> that maybe you didn't want to do how do we take a moment to pause and notice that they're doing something really great and pointing that out so you're boosting them up and helping them be in a better place so they can kind of take some of that um, uncertainty a little bit better because they're feeling feeling better about themselves yeah and I think that as a parent you also need to give yourself a little bit of a space um, to not just be churning and ruminating about your own worries or stresses but that you can be open enough to notice when you know, something very nice is happening, or at least something that's like, hey, that's not bad. I can make a nice comment about, you know, um, you, you seem to be really doing a great job about, you know, at this. And I'm so impressed with how persistent you've been. Um, even though you're not always as persistent about, you know, X, Y, or Z, I don't need to add that extra little uh, level of criticism. But um, I think there's two, there's kind of two things here that one is giving kids more choice or sorry, more control over doing positive things that channel their energy, that, that give them a sense that they've created something, that they've mastered something. But there's also the control that you were talking about, Dana, of a non-preferred activity of you can do this now, you can do it in five minutes, you know, or you can, we can space it with, you know, with, with we can do seesaw then we can do Legos, which is the conversation constantly in my households right now. So we, um, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, some of the home, you know, care uh, approaches um, when it comes to, to, to health behaviors, especially for kids with diabetes. 
um, you know, how to help kids when these are not the preferred activities that they want to be throughout their day. And so one of our questions is, without the structure of school, um, daily health behaviors have become increasingly challenging. So how can I help my child complete all the necessary medical care, um, probably without breathing down their neck or yelling at them all the time or, or doing other things that we as parents sometimes do to tighten our controls when, when things feel out of order? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think as we've talked in other episodes and other um, webinars, you know, as parents, we've relied quite heavily oftentimes and maybe without even noticing that we thrive on the structure and the routine that goes along with healthcare behaviors. And so oftentimes those behaviors we've kind of taken for granted occur linked with something else that maybe isn't happening anymore. So like getting ready for school is a time where kids brush their teeth and get ready and um, wash their face. And, you know, in families with chronic illness, maybe the time in which they take medicine or, um, you know, do breathing treatments or things like that. So they kind of happen naturally before, and now we're removing that uh, structure, which can make it particularly difficult. And caregivers kind of had built-in supports. They had teachers that were helping, coaches that were helping, maybe a daycare provider that was helping before or after school. Uh, and so now those additional supports have been removed. So we've talked about in other, in other situations about how um, those things are important, kind of setting up that daily routine and enlisting the help with other other caregivers. And so I think that remains particularly true when we think about um, health behaviors and that health behaviors are often those glass balls that we don't want to drop that, you know, other family members may be talking about brushing their teeth. And if they miss them in the morning, we can always catch it in the afternoon, but that's less the case. Um, you know, and kids that I work with talking about getting their insulin, they can't just wait until the evening to do it. And so it doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. So um, it can be particularly challenging. So I kind of think about three things that can really help families be um, successful in that. And I think, especially when we're, when we're, kind of in a time of stress, really taking healthcare behaviors on as a family task. And so it's not an individual having to complete their healthcare behaviors. It's the whole family that's kind of taking responsibility for it, even for those kids that were like on top of it and doing awesome um, when they were in the structure and when they had that daily routine and, and shared um, support from multiple caregivers, they might even need some extra support. And so using words like we are going to, or um, our care looks like. Um, so using those inclusive words, really emphasizing that it's a team approach to completing healthcare behaviors. So that's the first one is really being family focused. The second one is finding a system that works for you to track it. We all can identify how days are kind of uh, blending into one another. I don't know if today is Monday or Wednesday or, oh, it's a weekend. I didn't realize that. <laughs> um, so I think, all of us can identify with those kind of days leading into each other. And so what's a good tracking system for your family? Some families like just using a typical calendar, marking things off, some like that weekly schedule, some are very elaborate, some are extremely simple, some rely on technology, kind of whatever works for your family, kind of like Dr. Mollis was suggesting. You've got to kind of fit with what works best with your family and using those things to kind of promote a tracking system. But when it's healthcare behaviors and they're those glass balls, not the rubber balls that are okay if we just missed one day of brushing our teeth, um, some parents are probably going to cringe that that's the example. <laughs> Um, but how do we kind of make sure, and we review that at some sort of normal frequency. So we're looking to make sure that we're kind of keeping on track with those behaviors. And then the third thing I would suggest is keeping it positive. Um, as humans, we all avoid things that are unpleasant, um, no matter what. And so we don't want health behaviors to become something that's unpleasant. And we don't want that communication always about managing healthcare um, or, or simple health behaviors to just become nagging. Parents don't like it, kids don't like it, and then we avoid doing it. We just stop talking about it. And not talking about it doesn't make it go away. So thinking about praising not only the behavior, but the effort that it took, like, wow, it was great that you stopped what you were doing and you stopped that game you were playing or um, before you ran outside, you did this, or I know you were really eager to um, go help your dad outside, but you stopped and you did your care first. That's awesome. Um, and then thinking about reinforcing what helped complete that behavior. So not only that the task is completed or that they worked hard at it, um, but what helped them be successful so then they can replicate that the next time. 
And then, you know, spending time problem solving about how to be successful in the future instead of focusing on what didn't work in the past. So kind of stepping back and thinking about the family approach, kind of tracking systems, whatever works best in, in an individual's family, and then trying to keep it as positive as possible. We have to be kind to ourselves that we're not going to be 100% successful at it all the time. Uh, and that's okay. We can we can accept that passing grades are okay right now. <laughs> and um, not hesitating to, to reach back out to your healthcare teams and uh, asking for help when you're struggling. There's lots of people who want to support you and they're still there even if you're not face to face with them. So those are the things that kind of come to my mind. That's great. And I think that there's there that sense of knowing you can reach out to someone to check in about planning ahead. Um, you know, as Nasu was saying that there's there's resources that we may not be aware of. There's other so many millions of families are struggling with the same things right now that it really does help um, to know that other families have been through the same thing and there are trusted ways of approaching them. And I, I have also found that sometimes parents are just relieved to know that I can say, we don't know what school's going to look like, you know, for my patients with autism or ADHD or learning disabilities in the fall, but let's set up a virtual appointment in August so we can just touch base. And even just knowing that you've reached out to your healthcare providers and that there's, you know, someone to touch base with and, and that you'll be able to figure it out together over time helps you kind of take that load off your mind and being able to just focus on the now. Um, and I think that the, um, when we're trying to get children to do what I call, you know, non-preferred activities that often, you know, in my world of, of kids with autism, it's often, it could be schoolwork, it could be getting dressed, it could be lots of other things that introduce a motor challenge, a sensory challenge, a, um, you know, something else that is just mentally hard for them. Um, trying to, you know, pair it with a reward after work, not, not, it doesn't have to be like a sticker. It could be a, you know, some sort of social reward or some natural reward afterwards really can help helping break down the task into something that helps them with the steps that don't come easy to them, whether it's due to motor planning, maybe you help them with, you know, one aspect of, of getting dressed instead of just saying sink or swim, you know, try to do it all yourself and give a little bit more scaffolding. But I, I, what I hear from you, Dana, too, that I hear from a lot of families is we didn't even realize all this structural support that we had for our kids until school went away. And you didn't realize, oh my gosh, this relied on that, relied on that. And, you know, there was so much that we can't recreate about school and being okay with that and being creative about coming up with new systems that work with what our families um, can cope with right now. Um. Well, and, and I, you know, I, I, I agree completely with Jenny and Dana, everything you said. I just wanted to highlight a few really um, important things that, that you guys had mentioned. And, you know, one is, um, you know, as a, as a parent, as a caregiver, the energy you bring, the positivity, as Dana said, is so critical. And a lot of times we don't realize how we come off because we are the teacher, the um, you know parent, the uh, you know the scheduler, the million of tasks. Plus, we're also managing a variety of other competing uh, issues, as well as evolving issues in our work environment and and other community um, environments that we interface with, uh, and the detachment from family, uh, there, there can be a lot of um, strong emotions and thoughts that we have as, as caregivers. I'm a parent myself. And so being able to set aside a little bit of time to do some self-reflection, to take care of ourselves as caregivers, can also help us be really positive in there with our kids as we're trying to help them through uh, these challenging times and navigating their healthcare needs. Um, the other thing that I think has been highlighted by everybody here is we want to really focus on setting up these kids for success. Um, um, achievable small tasks that are chunked out over time um, can be much more digestible than, um, you know, the overwhelming task of an eight-hour school schedule or, or you know, uh, insulin injections throughout the day and and being able to kind of be here and now focused and 
and to to be able to support your kid in kind of thinking about how can we break this down into something that's achievable, successful, and then reinforcing that with praise. And as much as um, we think about incentives being video games and Barbie dolls and things like that, you know, it could be just that praise that my my caregiver is happy that I succeeded and I did well. And sometimes we, uh, I think, undervalue uh, the, va- the 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 um, praise and 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 how kids really receive that and how they experience that. And so, being specific about your praise and being able to do that uh, allows your child to experience success. And when you experience success over and over, that tends to embed behaviors um, because kids want to. Uh, feel a sense of accomplishment. They want to feel like they're doing the right thing. Yeah, and I think that there's a sense of, um, you know, an extra drive for mastery or for or for feeling like they have control over something, as I said before, um, that can be especially satisfying for sensitive kids right now who are feeling, you know, the world kind of moving in so many ways in uh, around them. Um, and so, so definitely, uh, I, even, you know, as, as all of us do, being uh, parents with multiple other things swirling in our heads, I, I did find that, um, at least over this weekend, that there were a few times where I just was like, let's go play, let's go do something, let's go. And I think the look in my kids' eyes was like, oh, there you are. You know, it really does, as you're saying, Nessu, like, when you come with that mindset of like, I'm going to be positive. I'm just going to be here with you. I I don't care what's going on, you know, outside of our four walls. Um, I'm just going to let that stuff go right now and just be here with you. And it's such a relief for kids when they, when they feel that from us. And I know we're not able to do it 24 hours a day. We have, we have so many pressures on us as parents, but um, I just wanted to, to tell that story because it's really interesting how, um, how children sense that and how they respond to us, I think, a little bit more um, effectively <laughs> or reciprocally when they feel that we're there paying attention to them, listening to them, um, and working with them in kind of more of a playful, open open attitude. Um, all right, so our last question of uh, the episode has to do with wearing masks, which all of us grownups do um, have had to deal with, and they, they don't always feel good. They don't you know, always look uh, appealing to people, but they are now a new necessary part of our normal because of how they help prevent the spread of COVID. Um, so as children are going to be coming back into our hospital for care, for in-person care, as, as they may be going out into the community, um, how to help children wear masks more. So in this question, um, my child has a heart condition and developmental delay. I know he needs to wear a mask, but he refuses. So it's even harder when kids have may have sensory reasons, may have developmental reasons that it's harder. So, um, and in this case, the doctor said he should wear one uh, when we return for his procedure. So, Melissa, what kind of guidance do you have for families around mask wearing? This is something you know not only for kids with medical issues, but all kids are are probably going to have to get used to in the coming months. Sure. Yeah. I, I, you know, all of us, all of us are getting used to this. Um, you know, as we as we adjust to the world around us, um, we're going to actually be posting on the webinar today an infographic um, that was created by two heart organizations for our, our um, transplant population. But I think it's um, really helpful to all all patients and families um, with some tips from the CDC and some tips from our infectious disease doctors we worked with, and then um, psychology as well. But I'll, I'll review some of the things. Again, mask wearing is something that um, many kids with chronic illness have done before. Um, but, you know, and so I've learned from the patients that I've worked with, our transplant patients are actually asked to wear masks for three months after they get a transplant. Um, and so as I've been talking with patients over these past few weeks, I've been asking them, you know, what helped you? What tips do you have for other kids, the friends that you meet with that, you know, now have to wear masks like They've been doing this. They've done this before. They went back to school still wearing masks. And so, um, you know, I, I've, I've asked them as professionals to kind of give us some tips. And certainly a lot of the same things are, are coming out. So, um, so, so first, I do want to say, though, that 
Um, the CDC does not recommend that kids under two wear masks. So, you know, certainly talk with your doctors if you have questions about your kids wearing masks. Um, but, but we know that it's, it's unsafe for, for the little ones and babies to wear masks. So um, when I'm talking about these tips, these are definitely for our older kids. Um, but one thing that patients that I've worked with um, have said is helpful is, is giving some of that control that we keep talking about. So as able, letting them pick out a mask um, or the color, or the fabric, um, you know, if, if that's something that you're able to do. Um, for fabric masks, they may want to contribute to decorating it. Um, I have seen some really cool masks over the years, even before COVID, you know, I've, ha I've had kids, um, they're, they're really into getting um, some cool masks and, and, and decorating them. But we do know from our, our ID colleagues, our infectious disease colleagues, that if it's a surgical mask, um, we wouldn't want them to decorate that, that that can ruin the integrity. But the fabric masks that we're seeing out and about, those might give them some um, potential to, to, to insert some control in, in some of their own um, you know, personality. Um, the other thing, is, and, and we're hearing this too, you know, our kids look to us um, for a lot, how to react to things. And the same is true for mask wearing. So it's important for parents and adults in their lives to be a good mask wearing role model, uh, you know, that, that we're modeling for them, that we're doing this too, to protect um, others around us. Um, and that, you know, that we're, we're adjusting to this and um, it's an important thing for us to, to do to be able to, to start to go out into the world in a, in a safe way. Um, and so they see our attitude. You know, if we put it on, we're like, gosh, I hate this thing and this is so annoying and no one can see me anymore and I can't talk. Our kids are going to hear that as well. Um, so, you know, I have to say, I, 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 I got a mask um, for my three-year-old. Um, I don't know when she'll wear it, but, it, but we're prepared. It's purple. And when I showed it to her, she said to me, does this mean I get to go in the store now? And she was so excited. She wanted to put it on right away. Um, but, you know, certainly I think that we've been really positive about this thing that we have to do, knowing that it's important for the people around us. And her first response was so excited about getting to wear this. Um, and so modeling that for our kids. And we've yeah. talked about that before, the idea that we are we're helping be meaning makers around what these different new behaviors mean. Sure. Um, and I know I know parents have heard this from us every episode of using this as an opportunity to model your grit and your problem solving, you know, uh, resources and resilience. And that if you show, OK, I don't like this, but I'm going to be flexible and I'm going to do it because it's the best thing for what the society needs or um, it's what our, you know, next door neighbors need or because they, you know, we, we want to protect our community. Um, these, you know, reframing these tough moments as all teaching moments and learning moments and growth moments are, um, is one way to feel, number one, that we as parents have more power in to make this challenging moment what it can, you know, what it could be. Um, and it also, like you said, like the power of what we do rather than what we say is always, always going to be the first thing that children are noticing about us. They're little observers from day one. Yeah. And therefore, we're, you know, we, it's important for us to be actually living it, not just talking it. Yeah. Um, and I think some other change. Some other things we can try at home, you know, you certainly you certainly don't want the first time that you're asking them to wear a mask to be when you're coming back for your, you know, first in-person hospital visit. That might be already a stressful time for your family and you're going to notice, you know, some things have changed at the hospital or elsewhere where you're going. And so, you know, I would encourage parents to, to practice mask wearing at home um, and you know you can you can all wear it when you're doing something fun when you're watching a, a movie when you're playing a board game when you're playing hide and seek um, for young kids or those with sensory issues you may just start with practicing it for a minute at a time and continue to work up day after day to two three four minutes um, and and you know building that in we've talked about reward and praise and so certainly if if your child is practicing wearing their masks, then, you know, providing them with that praise for doing something um, that they, you know, maybe didn't want to do or that was hard for them is really important. Um, and then, you know, using masks as part of play, you know, we, I think that that's also helpful for kids. Um, so, you know, going and, and making some masks and putting them on their doll or putting them on, you know, their stuffed animal, um, those might be some helpful things to integrate at home too. But, you know, practicing it in less 
threatening or less scary ways at home is, is really helpful um, for, for when you do step out into the community. Um, so uh, hopefully those are some helpful tips to try out at home. Yeah, and I think this conversation has really been um, not only specific to families who've, whose kids need to come into the hospital more frequently to see us or who's, um, you know, who've dealt with a lot of medical uncertainty um, in their lives before, but there's been a lot that I hope that other families um, kind of can take away in terms of helping your kids get a feeling of more control, helping them do the sorts of things, the health behaviors that we know are really important, but um, we don't always feel like doing when we're in our pajamas watching TV all day. And and also just how to manage your own sense of um, what can you do right now when the rest of the world feels like it's an uncertain mess. Um, so any last, you know, questions or comments, um, you know, before we wrap up? So uh, we were having a discussion actually earlier, and I, I, I think it's probably pointed to bring it out. Uh, you know, there, there's so much tragedy and difficulty that we've had to experience with with all these transitions and changes. Uh, but one of the um, aspects of this that may be a relative positive that, that we talked about a little bit is the fact that um, we're all going through a shared experience. So as hard as we may feel this is, everybody else is feeling it in their own way, but they're all struggling in some way. And um, again, I, I would just say, you know, uh, Chronic illness is challenging without a pandemic. Um, dealing with it with a pandemic is extremely difficult, but we're all in this together. And um, knowing that we're not alone, um, there are resources out there. People are going through the same thing. I'm sure parents are talking to each other as well and kind of sharing tips and um, you know uh, highlighting experiences. Um, but but one of the things that that has come out of this is that. It, you know, it's normalized a bit that discussion of the emotional experience of going through this and going through chronic illness and um, experiencing difficulties and uncertainty. And so um, to echo everything everybody said, and I, I am so humbled to be with this group, uh, is the fact that, um, you know, we, we can model and we can talk about those experiences. Uh, and, and there's a uh, clearly a uh, a, a tremendous event that requires us to talk about it, uh, but there may be opportunities to really tap into some of the strong emotions and thoughts that some of our kids may be having that may not have come up because there wasn't this crisis. So just wanted to share that as, as one kind of potential positive from all this. I think that's a beautiful point. And I hope it's, you know, I'm always an optimist and want to believe that that growth happens through challenging times. So. It may be something that you know our medical community and mental health community also tries to work on. You know, in the coming months, as families are really having to think about, reflect upon, acknowledge their own emotional state, what their body does under stress, what their family does under stress. Who are we? You know, it's a it's a really kind of existential experience, and um, you know, I do feel like there's so many good. Um, mental health providers who are eager to help families figure that out if, if they're motivated by what what we've all been through um, collectively through through such a stressful time. So so thank you all uh, for for joining our episode today. Um, thank you parents for again devoting your limited time to um, another one of our episodes. Uh, please submit more questions next week. Uh, episode six is going to be about perinatal well-being and mental health um, during COVID. So if you have pregnant friends, friends who've just had babies, if you're a grandparent who is worried about how someone you, you love is coping, um, please submit those questions and we'll see you next week. Take care.